hold it up. We want to make a confession that will shape our week. You know, the Bible talks about this book of the law not departing from your mouth. Amen. That you should meditate day and night. It's not enough just to come to church on Sunday. You've got to live the church Monday through Saturday. Amen. And then come and find out what else to live on. Amen. So hold up your Bible and let's make this as a confession. Say it out loud. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I do what it tells me to do. And I love my Bible. So I make it as a confession that I will meditate therein both day and night on a chapter in the morning and a chapter in the evening. And because I do, my life is blessed. It is no more a mess. Now everything I touch, come on, everything I touch will turn to success. Anybody believe that? Come on. Hallelujah. My life will turn to a success. Let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this another great opportunity to hear from heaven. The steps of a good man are ordered of you. You knew exactly in advance who would be here today, who wouldn't be. You knew who would be listening online, who would hear this message days and weeks and even months later. Well, we pray for every one of us that not one of us will leave the same way that we came, but that we all will be changed into what your word has declared and described for our lives. We pray that we'll see the message, that we'll understand it, and we'll learn from it and be able to apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated. Glad to be with you all again on this beautiful Sunday morning. I believe I have a word from heaven, and I felt a little rushed at the first service, and so I am going to go quickly through the points of this message because I really want to be able to minister the last point of the message. Um, each part of this is significant, and so I encourage you to be uh, quick to hear. Amen. Amen. Listen quickly, gather it, grab it, and uh, be able to apply it in life. I want you to open your Bible, if you would, to the book of Mark chapter 5. Now, in Mark chapter 5, we find the story of Jairus. Jairus was the ruler of a synagogue, and he had a daughter, 12-year-old daughter. How many of you all love your kids? I love my kids. I had to babysit this weekend. My wife and other women went to the... Dads don't babysit their own kids. It felt like babysitting. <laughs> My wife tells me the same thing. You're not babysitting. They're your kids. <laughs> well, I couldn't, I couldn't go where I wanted to go. Couldn't do what I wanted to do. That's babysitting. <laughs> well, everybody, you know, we love our kids. And Jairus loved his kid. And, and his daughter, 12-year-old, was at the point of death. I want you to imagine that. That's got to be tough. Very serious situation. He came to Jesus. Now, when he left his house, where she was at the point of death, he had to travel to Jesus. Jesus gets held up along the way, couldn't get there as quick as he could. While he's ministering to somebody else, the Bible says that they came from, the, from Jairus' house and said, your daughter's dead. And Jesus speaks to Jairus and tells him, don't be afraid. Fear has the potential to sabotage your miracle. And that's the point of this entire series. We've got to find a way in life to fear nothing. In life, to not even fear death. It is so critical. And we see the urgency in the very moment. In Mark chapter 5 and verse 36, the Bible says, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, as soon as Jesus heard them tell Jairus, don't even bother the master, your daughter is dead. As soon as Jesus heard that word, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. One, one, uh, 
one writer, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, said in Luke, fear not, believe only, and she will be made well. Now I want you to imagine something's going on in your child's life or one of your children's life. And it's a pretty serious situation. And the reports that you're getting, what you're seeing in them, in your mind, doesn't look good. I'm here to tell you not to allow fear in your heart at all. Only believe that good will come out of it. Why? Because fear is the opposite faith. What do you mean the opposite faith? If you could reverse the polarity of faith, it would be fear. For example, in certain things like an electrical motor, if you reverse the polarity, it'll run backwards. It'll run the same way that it normally runs, but if you reverse the polarity, it'll run backwards. How many of you can get the idea of that? I want you to imagine faith is an engine that you and I use that cause God's good and blessing to manifest in our lives. Everything we receive from God is by faith through his grace. He's given it to us through his grace, but we receive it. We access it by faith. We use the engine of faith to reach into the realm of the unrealities and bring it into the realm of reality. That's what faith does. If you were to reverse the polarity, though, and faith worked backwards, it would actually bring into your life what you don't want to happen. And we saw that happen in a number of individuals in the word of God, Job being one of them. And so this situation is so serious that we've taken time over these last weeks. Now, fear not, believe only is the goal of this entire series, and I'm actually concluding it today. So if you've missed any part of it, you can go back and listen on Facebook and on our website. But I want to show you from the word of God how to live a fear-free and faith-filled life. But I want you to get and I to get to the place where you are afraid of nothing. If you're afraid of roller coasters, if you're afraid of spiders, if you're afraid of, you know, water, you know, then it's not good, even though it may not be as, as serious as life or death. But to allow fear in any area of, of your life creates a foothold, a doorway or an access point into your life. You don't want to allow it in any area. Amen? It's not good to live afraid. You may feel like, you know, you're afraid to fail. And that's a real, a real it could be a real fear. Or maybe you're afraid that they only want you because of your money. You know, you get a call from, you, you know, your adult son or your adult daughter or, you know, so-called friends in life. And, you know, you're at a point of retirement and ready to kick back and relax. And, but, you know, you live with this fear that all they want is my money. They don't want me for me. That they just want what I have. Or maybe you're in a marriage and, and you're afraid that something's going on or will go on or something will happen. Amen. Uh, you don't want to allow any area of fear. I'm sorry, I'm ringing a little bit. Can you take me down? All right, thanks. Sorry. Um, taking advantage uh, that we... It may be for your money or for your job, et cetera. So I'm led to conclude this series today talking about how, uh, back up a little bit, talking about how fear works. Fear is a kind of faith, and therefore, faith works by several components in the word of God. Amen. Uh, and so God is showing us how fear works today so we can avoid it functioning, avoid functioning with fear in life. So number one, if you're taking notes, uh, fear works by saying. Fear works by saying. Let's get into that today. All right. Back down just a taste. I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, fear works by saying. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Mark chapter 11, verse 22. Mark chapter 11, verse 22. It says this. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Jesus was the greatest teacher on the subject of faith that has ever lived. Amen? And one of the things that he found opportunity to do was to teach people to live by faith. Well, we're going to learn something today about faith uh, because faith works by saying, and that's what Jesus is teaching them. But because fear is the opposite of faith, 
Fear also works by saying. Watch this. In teaching about how the God kind of faith works, he says, have the God kind of faith or have faith in God. Verse 23, it says, for surely I say to you, whosoever says to this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Notice that four times in this one verse of scripture, he uses the word says. Why? Because that's how faith works. He says you can say to a mountain to move and it will, it will obey you. Now, in that day, he was actually talking about a literal mountain. Now, that might be impossible for your mind to wrap, it, wrap itself around, but he literally meant it. How many of y'all know when God tells a mountain to move, it will move? Well, if you have the faith of God, if you use the same kind of faith that God uses, if you speak to a mountain in your life, I'm not talking about just a figurative mountain. You could have the authority to speak to a physical mountain. And if you use God's faith, you could cause that, fountain, that mountain to move. Faith works by saying, though, he says, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain and believe that those things that he says, he will have whatever he says. Why does he emphasize the word saying? Because faith works by saying it doesn't work by thinking. If you want good to happen, you have to actually speak for good to happen. And in the reverse, if you don't want bad to happen, stop talking. it. That's a big number one. I mean, it's not, not that it's not going to happen because you just didn't say it, especially if you have it in your heart and you're just keeping yourself from saying it. But the way fear works, fear works by saying. And oftentimes when people are in fearful situations, they will speak out of their fear. They will actually say what they don't want to happen. Notice he says he will have whatever he says. Notice he didn't say he'll have the good that he says, but not the bad. If you believe in your heart that something bad is going to happen and you say it out of your mouth, you will have what you say. Except for the grace and the mercy of God. You know, I believe with all of my heart that God actually has to turn down the power of our words. Because if we got everything, if what we if everything we said came to pass, we'd be in a bad situation. Why? Because somebody said the other day, my back is killing me. <laughs> right? Now think about that. And I know it's laughable and that's funny and that's for real, right? We can say, that, oh man, that tickled me to death. If, we, if, every word, <laughs> if every word that we said came to pass, we would be dead and long gone by now. Matter of fact, other people would be dead. I can't stand you. I, you know, I wish you would die. Oh my gosh. Right. And the Bible talks about out of the same mouth shouldn't come blessing and cursing. I literally believe that God has to dial down the power of our words until we learn the authority that we have. Now I'm preaching good because when you are afraid of something happening, we know that faith is a firm persuasion, a conviction based upon hearing fear, which is the opposite faith. It is a firm persuasion. You are actually persuaded based upon the circumstance that this is not going to turn out good. It comes when you accept this truth, something that you hear. And the way it works is when you open your mouth and say what you are afraid of. The next verse in Numbers chapter 14, we find a group of people who did exactly that. Think about this. In Numbers chapter 13, God told them, I want you all to go to see the land that I'm giving you. I've been talking to Moses about this. I'm, excuse me. I've been talking to Moses about it. But God said, I've been talking to Abraham about it. Isaac, I promised him. Jacob, all of Israel. Now you are hundreds of years past them. And I'm finally ready to give this land that I promised to them to you. I want you to go in and see how good this land is. Send in some spies so you can be ready when you get there, so you're not thrown off when you get there, and then come back. They went in in chapter 13. They came out. Twelve of them went. Ten of them brought back an evil report. Two of them were like, let's go do it now. But the ten that brought back an evil report made the people's heart sink. They cried all night. They complained against Moses. They even questioned God. Why? 
because they were made to be afraid. Fear will keep you out of your promised land. You cannot afford it. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 1, it says, So all the congregation lifted their voices and they cried. They cried as a result of being afraid. And the people wept that night. Verse 2. And the children of Israel complained. Not only were they crying, but then they started complaining against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, if we had only died in the land of Egypt, and if we had only died in this wilderness, they'd rather die to go into the land that God had promised them. What's going on? They said, why has the Lord brought us into the land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should become victims? Would it not better for us to return to Egypt? What's going on here? They heard that there were giants in the land. They heard that there were strong walled cities like Jericho in that land, and they were afraid as a result of the bad report. And notice this, and this, this really shocked me. They called evil what God called good. In the New Testament, he, Peter was told, do not call what God has cleansed uncommon. In other words, when God says something is good, it's good. Amen. Amen. That's what made it an evil report. But the people believed that it was something bad that was going to happen. And notice, they cried as a result of their fear. They complained. They started speaking as a result of their fear. They're speaking out of fear. And they started questioning as a result of their fear. In the book of Job, chapter 1, we also notice this. In verse number 5, Job said, or it says here, that it was when the days of feasting had run uh, in their course that Job would send and sanctify them and he rose early in the morning and off to offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all for Job said it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts and thus Job did regularly if you look up at me for a moment I like you know somebody said well you like people to look up at you well no I'm the pastor I stand on a platform amen I just want to get your attention for a minute you don't remember the story of Job right he was the most wealthy individual in all of the land because God had protected him. God had blessed him. Amen. He had 10 sons and he had 10 children, seven sons and three daughters, and he had uh, his health. But by the end of this story or, or at this point in the story, he's about to lose all of his children, his health and all of his wealth. I submit to you the reason why he lost it all was because he was afraid of losing it. He literally said in Job chapter 3, verse 25, the thing that I feared the most has come upon me. The thing that I dreaded has happened. Some of you are here, you love your children, but you dread the phone ringing at night. I've been there sometimes, weird. I mean, you get a call at 1 in the morning. Come on, that's got to be serious. And as a pastor, I keep my phone on just in case some emergency. I need to go to the hospital, pray for somebody. Amen. But some of you dread getting a call from your kids that something bad has happened. You, you, you're afraid that they'll get in an accident. You're afraid that, you know, they'll call from the school. Oh, what, what's going on? And, and you, you, you're panicking. What are you doing? You are living your life subject to the bondage of fear. And what God is saying is don't live like that. Fear not. Believe only. Look at what Job was doing. Fear works by saying, you'll know if you're afraid of something, just listen to how you've been talking about it. Oh, I'm so worried that something will happen. Oh, I'm afraid of being laid off. Oh, you, I heard that this was, a, if you watch your words, you'll hear whether fear is in you or not. Amen. Because again, you can be in a bad situation and still speak with a boldness and a confidence of faith. The Bible says that every day he would offer burn offerings according to the number of them all. Why? Because Job said, and he kept saying, every day, he said, you know, I better offer an offering because they probably have sinned. They're over there partying. They're over there, they would have a feast, right? They're over there partying. I know they probably, not only are they partying, they probably curse their hearts and, and curse them. You know, you, you're thinking things that are going on with your children. Maybe they've gotten into inappropriate relationships, whether it be the same sex or opposite sex. And in your heart, you're afraid of getting this report. You're afraid of getting this response. Listen, child of God, don't live your life like that. Amen. You, what they need more than ever is your faith. 
mm, mm, mm. They need to be, you, you need to believe that they're going to turn out even if it looks like they're going the wrong way. I believe that they'll get back right on track and be right where they're supposed to be. And you can have that confidence right in the face of adversity. Job said it. He said it may be. He didn't know for sure. Maybe is like, well, I'm not sure, right? He believes that they've done something bad. You can believe that your children have done something. Now, they could be doing something bad, but he, he doesn't know it. See, he's afraid because he, does, he doesn't know it. He's afraid of it. Once you know it, you know it, and then you deal with it, right? But if you don't know it, there's no reason to be afraid of it. He did it regularly. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 14, the disciples were in a bad situation. They were about to die. They were in a boat and a storm was on the water. I believe it was so urgent that Jesus walked on the water to go to them. When he got there to them, they thought he was a ghost. He's there to rescue them, right? And they're thinking they're a ghost. Why? Because they're, they're actually overcome by fear. How do you know it? Well, the Bible says when they saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying it is a ghost and they cried out for fear. The nature of fear, the way fear works, it'll, it'll cause you to speak up as a result of what you're afraid of. You can have something in your heart and mind that's going on and you're thinking, mm, something's going on, something's going on. And if you allow that to fester in you, the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will what? Speak. And now all of a sudden you're starting, well, what you been up to? <laughs> You're only saying that because of the fear that's in, it, that's in you as a result of them. It'll cause you to speak as well. You cry out as a result of fear. What's my next one? I'm trying to hurry here. The Bible says, and, and I have to move on to that. That's just the first point. The Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. If you're speaking death and the fear of death, you're going to eat the fruit of it. But if you speak life over your family and over your finances, over your situation, then you'll experience that no matter what it looks like. How many of y'all see that? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Jesus said it this way. He said, therefore, take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Now, thoughts can come to your mind, but you don't have to take the thought. Brother Hagen taught me that you cannot keep birds from flying over your hair, head. Is that true? Yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, my, my, my three-year-old, he'll be three this week. Cool, that's great. This is his birthday. <laughs> he, he now can identify when a plane is flying or a bird. And he'll say, Dad, bird. You know, it's like, yeah, cool, right? <laughs> well, you cannot. It's impossible unless you shoot the bird, right? But then there's so many birds, you can't shoot all the birds. Anyway, you can't keep birds from flying over your hair. But how many of y'all know you can keep them from making a nest in your hair? How does a bird make a nest? Watch this. They take a little piece and they bring it and position it. And then they take, they go get another one and they bring it and they position it. Then they go get another piece and they bring it and they position it. The enemy has been building a nest in your hair. He brings a little thought that maybe they're doing this. Bring another thought, maybe they're doing that. Bring a thought, and maybe you have arthritis. Bring another thought, your grandma had arthritis. <laughs> I'm, I'm, being, I'm being so real, right? The, the other week. I was carrying my son. We, we, we were doing some traveling. And I'm, I mean, this boy is like 25, 30, 30 pounds at least. And I'm carrying him through the airport. And I had to be holding him in lock, right, for like 30 minutes. I mean, security and then up and down, up and down. And later on that day, my elbow was like hurting. <laughs> but later that day, I'm not thinking about that for 35, 45 minutes. I'm thinking, no, that ain't arthritis. <laughs> Man, I'm preaching better than you say it, amen. No, no, all of a sudden, later on, I feel this ache in my elbow, and the thought comes. Somebody say the thought comes. The thought comes, you know, that might be arthritis. Now, I've learned 
I've learned, don't let that come out of my mouth. Right? Because the, the way you take a thought is by saying. That's what, go back, look at it. In, in, in Matthew, uh, he said, therefore, take no thought doing what? Saying. The way you take a thought, the way you sign for it is when you re-speak it. For example, they were thinking, what are we going to do about food? They were thinking, what are we going to do about drinking? They were thinking, what are we going to do about being clothed? How many of y'all know when you're in a tight spot, everything can talk to you? I mean, I've been there where I've been broke, and it's cloudy outside, and all of a sudden it starts raining, and that kind of feels like my life. You know, just like an overcast, and things are dark and heavy. Come on. Next thing you know, you turn on the windshield wipers, and they start talking to you. What are you going to do now? You ain't got no way to pay this bill. You did the car you driving. They go, and what are you gonna do now? And then you turn it up. What are you gonna do now? What are you gonna do now? What are you gonna do now? <laughs> Things have a way of planning thoughts. And then next thing you know, what am I gonna do now? He said, take no thought by saying. Somebody say, watch your words. Watch your words. So that was my whole point. Normally, I would take 35, 40 minutes, preach that, and then come back next week and preach the second point. But I got to get to the fourth. I know this is fast. First thing is, fear works by saying. Don't allow it in your life. Watch your words. Number two, faith works by doing. Not only will fear make you cry out and say something, it'll also cause you to act in fear. You can start moving things because you're afraid. You can start hiding things because you're afraid. You can start, come on, talk, right? You, you, you do, what are you doing? You're acting out of fear. Where did we get that from? We get it from Adam and his wife, Eve. In Genesis chapter 3, they sinned. And listen to me, folks. Every time we sin, we open the door to fear again into our hearts. You cannot sin without fear. Fear is um, a symptom of sin. There's five things that show up when you sin. It, it, the complete picture of it is unrighteousness. When you do something God says don't do, you will feel unrighteous. Guilt shows up. Shame shows up. Inferiority shows up. Condemnation shows up. And fear shows up. That's for a different day to teach. But what I want to say to you, because the Bible says that when we do something we shouldn't do, we look over our shoulder for judgment to come. In other words, I did something bad, so I'm expecting bad to happen. And actually, you can end up causing bad to happen by expecting it to happen, right? How many of y'all know God is gracious and merciful? Matter of fact, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 says, it is of the Lord's mercies that you are not consumed. You know what mercy is? Mercy is, is when you've done something bad and somebody gives you a break. I don't know about you, but I've been there in situations where I've needed the mercy of God. It wasn't my goodness because I was a churchgoer, because I was a preacher's kid, that I need, th I need them to get me off on this. No, it's of his mercy. I need his mercy. I need, I need not to get what I do deserve, right? So thank God for his grace and his mercy. But every time we sin, fear shows up. That's why this series is so important for you to get. You need to know what fear looks like so you can keep it out of your life. Why? Because you will make a mistake in the future. Let me say it better. You will sin in the future. I'm saying this even for myself. Just the other week, I stood in this pulpit, pulpit and apologized for some things that I said to people in a wrong way. You know, just because I'm your pastor doesn't mean I'm perfect. Amen. I'm glad you think I'm perfect, but I'm not. I, I do things I'm not supposed to do, say things I'm not supposed to say, go places I'm not supposed to go, see things I'm not supposed to see. Come on. And I need to go through the process of what the Bible says. If we say that we have no sin, we're lying and the truth is not in us, right? But he says, but if you confess your sins, come on, if you own up to it, yeah, I did it. I'm sorry for it. God, please forgive me. Not only will he forgive you of your sin, come on, he will cleanse you, come on, of all the unrighteousness. And that includes fear. He'll, it, he'll, that, that cleansing will cause that fear to leave you. Adam and Eve sinned, and they hid themselves. Notice, in Genesis, they heard a sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves. You know, don't not come to church when you sin. 
come to church. Why do people do that? You know, they, 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 they do something they ain't got no business to do, so they're going to skip church that week. So I really got to look at the people on Facebook for right now, like, why, why, why? <laughs> he has already forgiven you of all your sins. Don't run away from God when you miss it. Run to him. Amen. Matter of fact, being here is going to actually help you feel better, not worse. Because you'll find out that he really, really does love you, and he has already forgiven you. Amen? But get it off of you. Don't run and hide. But notice what they did. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Why? He said, Adam, where are you? In verse 10 it says, he said, Adam, where are you? He said, I heard your voice and I was afraid. I was what? Come on, talk to me now. I was what? Fear works by doing something. I was afraid, I was naked, and I hid myself. What did he do? Come on. He hid himself. Fear works by doing. It will alter your activities. I mean, normally you don't look at your husband's phone. Normally you don't go through your wife's email. But because, you know, things have been tight, and, <laughs> you know, then, then, then this thought, you know, you were on the job and somebody was talking about, girl, you know, you know, mm -hmm, they was cheating and all of a sudden the, the enemy put this thought in your mind. Come on, I know I'm preaching. I just, I just keep looking at Facebook. Come on, come on. So now all of a sudden you, you normally aren't that kind of person. You, I mean, you ain't never been that. But the enemy has been lying to you, telling you that, 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 that your wife is doing something she ain't got no business doing. She probably over there in the account. You, you, you all, now all of a sudden, come on. <laughs> something told me, come on. No, you were driven by fear. Not, not, I'm not saying that, oh, nothing has happened. But listen, don't allow fear to run your life and cause you to be something that you're not. If you want to know the truth about something, ask. Or better yet, let God guide you. Come on, let God set the situation up. Because when he does it, it'll be peaceable. It, there'll be mer there, it'll be at the right time. Come on, it'll be at the right way. You'll be ready. Come on, they'll be ready. Wow, who am I preaching to today? What's my next verse? All right, James chapter 2. I got to hurry through this verse. So fear works by doing. It'll cause you to do something. In James chapter 2, we learned this about faith. Faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, somebody say works, works. is dead. So faith works by doing something. He said, if you don't have any works, how can you say you have faith? I will show you my faith by what I'm doing. See, I believe it's going to rain, so I am building a boat. Right? It works by doing something. You can be, well, I believe, I believe it's going to rain, but if you aren't doing what God told you to do and it rains, then you're not going to be ready, right? So faith works by doing something. Because fear is the opposite faith, it also works by doing something. You find yourself acting in fear. But guess what? Fear, if it doesn't have works, is dead. That's a revelation too. So if you want to, you know, not allow yourself to function by fear, I know you're tempted to look. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible, I'm, I'm going to stay on this because it's got to be, I'm telling you, I sense it in my spirit. It's got to be somebody on Facebook, right? <laughs> the Bible says the Holy Spirit, when he has come, he will guide you into all truth. Some of you have been trying to play the Holy Spirit. Oh, but pastor, you don't know how bad this is. You know, we got a strain in our relationship. And then, uh -huh, you know, a year ago, I caught him looking at pornography. And, and so, you know, every now and then I got to look at the clear history on the, on the Internet. <laughs> I'm preaching good. No, you're being driven by fear. You know what's better is for that person to, you know, come to, to, to the place where they realize they've messed up and they come to you at the right time and say, you know what, 
I've been dealing with some things, and I know I shouldn't be dealing with that. And I'm, I'm just asking you to forgive me. And I've gotten before the Lord, and I've gotten with other folks, and, and, and you're going to see a difference in me. How many of y'all know that's a lot better yeah. than you playing uh, Magnum P.I.? <laughs> All right, enough of y'all on the Internet. I need to teach the church. Amen. So Job, one last thing about Job, not only did, did it work by saying in Job's life, it also worked by doing. Notice it says here, for Job said, somebody said he said, yeah. he said to him, I said something, but not only was he saying, he did. Somebody say he did. Yeah. And he did it regularly. What did he do? He was offering prayers and offering offerings. He was doing something, not out of faith. He was doing something out of fear, right? Yeah. Act in faith, don't act in fear. Next point. All right, so fear works by saying, fear works by doing. What's the third thing? Fear works by impatience. Yes. Look at this in the book of James. I believe it's James chapter 1 and verse 3 talks about faith. It says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. How many of y'all know that patience is important when it comes to faith? Yes. You, you, your faith actually works by patience. And the reason why it has to work by patience is because you have an enemy who is working against you. Your faith is the engine that causes God's good to manifest in your life. God wants good. He's provided good. He's made good available. Your engine of faith is what you use to cause good to come into your life. But you have an enemy who works against you trying to delay the manifested blessing of God in your life. And he's working hard at it. But if you remain patient, Patient. God will get to you what you have been believing for. <laughs> Got to be patient. Woo, I'm preaching good. So faith works by patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. But you say, Pastor, we're talking about the opposite faith. I'm glad you said that. Because fear works the opposite way. It works by impatience. What fear will do is cause you to act in haste. Come on, you'll say something and do something sooner than you should. Why? You, you're thinking, man, oh, I got to act quickly. Come on, right? It'll act, cause you to act hastily. Let me show you what I mean. I'll give you a couple examples. In Psalm 31, the Bible says, I said in my haste, I'm cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried unto you. Notice he said, I said, I'm speaking out of my fear, right? Fear works by saying, but notice I said in my haste, somebody say, in my haste. So, you know, old adage or old statement, uh, haste makes waste. See, when you act too soon, when you're impatient, meaning God's taking too long to deal with this person. God's taking too long to get this, this money to me. God's taking, you know, that's how you end up at the payday loan. <laughs> it was it was raining on Monday, you know. The, the you know the windshield wiper talking about you know what are you gonna do, what are you gonna do, you know. And, and then the devil bring you another thought. Well, you can go to payday. The money ain't needed until Friday. You over there on Tuesday talking about well I uh, I mean can, come on y'all y'all can do better than this. <laughs> For I said in my haste, let me give you another one. In Psalm 116, 11, how many of y'all thank God for faith family that actually gives you the Bible? There are things in your Bible that are awesome, right? Here's one. I said in my haste, in my what? Haste. All men are liars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see, what had happened was that old boy didn't do you right. And I know it. He didn't do you right. But then what came after that is wrong because you said all men are dogs. Now, right now, I'm just talking to the piano. <laughs> you ever hear that? All men are liars. Is that true? No, that ain't true. Jesus is a man. He never lied. After that, all men are liars. <laughs> or have lied at least. Amen. I said, go back one more time. I said in my haste. See, you've given up hope on relationships because of things that have happened in the past, because of hurts. And because you've concluded the matter that, you know, this is just the way it is, people aren't right, all, you come on, when you're doing these huge generalizations, that's not right. 
you know, now you've got, you know, different ethnicities that, you know, well, all people are this way. Well, no, that ain't true. Come on, I'm preaching good now. And what's happening is there's been some hurts, there's been some injuries, and in your haste, be patient. Let God, amen, you know, praise God. See, you could be in a tight spot and end up doing something you ain't got no business doing. I'm out there, so again, I sensed this one on Facebook. Just because the lawn man cut the grass don't mean you need to do something. Because you're trying to take care of some bills or something. I'm, I'm talking to the people on Facebook. I don't know where I'm going to get this money from to pay for this. Now I'm going to show you a serious story where a man lost his kingdom because of being in a tight spot and end up doing something out of haste that he ain't had no business doing. And we're getting close to closing because I'm getting tired. Amen. <laughs> First, thir- First Samuel 13, 6. This is an amazing story. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, a strait is a tight spot. I don't know about you, but I've been there where I've been in a tight spot. For the people were distressed. I don't know about you, but I've been there where I've been in a tight spot and I'm stressed about it. You know, there's a payment coming. There's there's something that's due there. They've got layoffs that are coming. The people did hide themselves. So now they're in a tight spot. You know, they're stressed out and now they're acting out of their fears. Right. They're hiding themselves in caves and thickets and rocks and high places and in pits. Sure enough, and some of the Hebrews went to the Jordan in the land of Gad. And now the people are starting to leave. But as for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, and they were shaken with fear, right? Verse 8 says, and he tarried there for seven days. Now notice the word tarry. It means to wait. He's waiting on God to show up. He's waiting on God to come through like he's supposed to. He waited according to the set time. Not only that, God promised him to be there. In other words, Samuel, the prophet, told Saul, I'll be there in seven days. I'll pray over you, and you'll have a victory over this army. Well, while they're waiting for seven days, they're getting nervous. Seventh day is coming up. How many of y'all know God is never late, but he could be last minute? And it's, (laughs) yeah, there's a lot of amens, God. We got to do something about this. (laughs) So listen, God is never late, but it can seem like he comes at the last moment. Again, it's not on him to do that. It's on your enemy that's trying to prevent God from getting to you what he promised. Come on. So it's not God wanting to hold you out to the last minute and then swoop in and save you. No, like he, you know, just want to rest. No, it's the enemy that's keeping from you what you need. Well, sure enough, he's in a tight spot. People are leaving. He's, he's, he's getting nervous. He's getting ready to speak out of fear and act out of fear. I want you to watch this. Samuel had appointed, but Samuel didn't come. He didn't come. It's the seventh day, and he didn't come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. What happened? Saul spoke out of his fear. He said, bring hither a burnt offering to me. Now, he's the king. Saul's the king. Kings don't offer the offerings. The prophets and the priests do that, right? He said, bring me the offering. And he offered the, he did something out of fear, right? So he spoke out of fear. He did something out of fear. Next one. Come on. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made the end of the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. I mean, as soon as he gets done. Oh, is that, is Samuel outside? Oh, man. He goes outside. He's like, oh, hey, Samuel, how you doing? We was waiting on you. Yeah, you ain't wait long enough. You ever been doing something and you ain't got no business doing and you got caught? Well, he's doing something. He ain't got no, and he's doing it out of his haste. Watch this. Samuel came. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that last part. Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. So he's greeting him. Now listen, when you offer a bull on, on, on a fire, how many of y'all know that smell like barbecue? <laughs> I'm going to cook at least four or five briskets this week, right? And I love the way that smell. 
Now, you got to know it. Matter of fact, I'm going to smell like smoke for the next three or four days after I do that, right? He's out there standing with Saul, like, hey, how you, how you doing, Samuel? And you smell like barbecue. <laughs> smoke rising over the tent. And, and Samuel is looking at him, and the next verse says, and Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw the people were scattered from me, and you didn't come in the time that you told me to come. So he blamed people for acting in haste. We do that. He blamed the man of God for acting in haste. We do that. Right? You didn't come in the time that you told. Well, it's still the seventh day. Evidently, he got there. It was at the last minute. You wait. You didn't wait long enough. Fear works by haste, works by impatience. And that the Philistines gathered together at Mishpah and a mishmash, and I said, the Philistines will come down upon me in Gilgal, and I have to make, I haven't made supplication to the Lord. I forced myself to do it, right? I offered a burnt offering. You ever feel like you've had to force yourself or you, the devil made you do it? <laughs> devil didn't make you do it. You did it, right? Amen. So I conclude on that point by saying fear works by impatience. Now, I sped through all of that to get to this point today. I need you to play softly for me. Fear works by hate. Now, if I were to ask how many of you all believe that God hates you, probably nobody would hold up their hand, and especially you on the Internet. I really want you to listen to this last point. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6, the Bible says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. How does faith work? Faith works by knowing that God loves you. Faith works by believing that God loves you. I'm going to ask you a very, very serious question, especially if you've been dealing with some fears, some things that have been happening. Maybe you're in a tight place and you're afraid that it's not going to turn out the way that you want. Things are looking like they're going the wrong way. I want to ask you this question. Do you believe that God loves you? Let's examine that. Because everything I've learned about love in life is that love always, and when I say always, always has your best interest at heart. I believe that. There's never a moment where love is trying to teach you a lesson because of something bad that you've done and wants you to experience something hard or difficult or even impossible because of the sins of your youth. See, God is love. That means he only wants good for you. He said in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. They're not thoughts of evil. They're thoughts of peace. To give you a hope and a future. I'm glad he said that because of some of the things that I've done in my past, I could think, somebody say I could think, I could think that God is mad at me or that, that God, because of those things, isn't causing good to happen to me in my present. That somehow or another, he thinks less of me because of those things than he does. He says, don't tell me how I think. I know the thoughts that I think towards you and they're not about evil. What else have I learned in life about love? I've learned that love will never leave you in a bad situation. I've been in some pretty bad situations in life. And in those times, even though it may not feel like it, sometimes, and as a pastor, so I've lived all my life for God as far as I know. I mean, I've had to repent of things, yes, but there's not a track in my life where I was just out living for Satan. Even when I was doing wrong, I was wanting to do right. There was a, a turmoil on the inside. I've lived for God and loved God all my life. But there have been times where bad things were happening in me and in my life. And in that moment, I felt like, God, do you love me? Because why is this happening? 
Why am I going through this? Why is, why is this up against me? You know, I'm not out there doing this. I'm not out there doing that. I didn't murder anybody. I didn't steal anything. Why me, God? Who am I talking to today? The situation can cause you to begin to question God's love for you. Because it's almost as if he's letting it happen. It's almost as if he's letting it go on and on and on and on. All of a sudden, we find ourselves like the disciples who lived with him, ate with him, and walked with him. We find ourselves in the boat trying to wake him up saying, don't you care that I'm dying in this? How do you get there? You get there by believe, believing something bad is going to happen to you. Again, I've learned that love will never leave you in a bad situation. Look at this. My question to you today is, do you believe that God hates you? The answer should be no. But when you allow fear to cause you to speak and do and act, then essentially fear is working by hate. Let me show you this in the Word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, and verse 25, he said, they also took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and they brought it down to us and they brought back word to us saying, it is a good land which the Lord our God has given us just to mark this moment. In Deuteronomy 1 and 25, in Deuteronomy 1 and 25, he's recounting what happened in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. We just looked at it. In Numbers chapter 13, they went to the good land and they brought back fruit. The grapes were so big that two men had to carry them on a pole between them. They showed them the good fruit of the land, but they also brought back a bad report. In Numbers 14, we saw that as of being made to fear, they cried out for fear. They complained because of they were in fear. And they questioned even, does God love us to bring us out, even to die in this wilderness? Notice, he said they took some of the fruit and they brought it down. And they brought, when they brought back word, and it's saying it is a good land, but verse 26 says, but he said, nevertheless, you wouldn't go up. Why didn't you go up? Because of fear. Nevertheless, you wouldn't believe even against the giants. Why? Because you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord. What is he saying? Verse 27. In verse 27, he says, not only that, you didn't go up. Why? Because you complained in your tents. What were you talking about? You said, because the Lord hates us. He brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of our Amorites and to destroy us. If you allow fear to take a root in your heart, you'll get to the place where you believe that God hates you because he's allowing you to go through what you're going through. I remember this woman, I was doing marriage counseling. And you might be in here, you might be in a really bad situation in your marriage. I was counseling, I, I, I preached that God hates divorce because that's what the Bible says. And that God can turn any situation around, no matter how impossible it may seem. Well, sure enough, that woman heard that, and her husband's not a church-going person. They came in for counseling, and I'm trying to encourage them in counseling. All right, well, you know, you need to focus on this, and you need to focus on that. Well, you know, he's always this, and, you know, she's that. Okay, all right, well, you know, God hates divorce. And this woman spoke up, and she says, this marriage is destroying me. And you're telling me that God hates divorce. So God hates divorce. This marriage is destroying me. And she looked me in my eye and she said it and I'm, I know that she meant it with all of our hearts. She said, God hates me. And when she said that, something touched in me so deep that I'll never forget it. That was almost 20 something years ago. God hates me because of what I'm in. God hates me because of what he allowed to happen. God hates me because of what I'm going through right now. Listen, child of God, don't believe that. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That is a lie. God is not your problem. Maybe something else is happening. Maybe something is going on with someone else. But the last person 
that you should ever turn against in your heart is God. You see, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16, and I'm done, I'm just closing, but you've got to get this. The Bible says that we have known and believed the love that God is, has for us. God is love. He who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Say it out loud, God is love. God is love. I want you to believe that. It is impossible for God to hate you. He hates things. He hates acts. But it's impossible for him to hate you, even if you've done things that he hates. If you've done acts that he is in, is, is in an, uh, in a, in a, in a, if it's an abominable, what is it? Even if you've done things that are an abomination to him, he still loves you. He absolutely does. It's impossible for God to hate you. You know, I'm thankful that they taught our children and they taught us in, in, as a child the songs that remind us that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so so important to believe that. Maybe you'll need to sing that when you're going through a tough time, right? To not allow fear to work on the inside of you, right? To remind yourself that it, whatever this is, it ain't God. It may be that he's coming at the last moment, but I know where my Redeemer lives. Yeah. Hallelujah. I, I close with the first part of this, and this now for the first time makes perfect sense. And, and first, go back to verse 16. I'm sorry, I threw you off. I, I close with the first part of this. For the first time in my life, this part makes sense. There are times in your life where you will know that you know that you're no-nos, that God loves you. You might be in one of those times right now. But if you're ever in a challenging time, you could begin to wonder if he does. In that very moment, what I'm encouraging you to do is believe that he does. See, in that moment, you don't know that he does because it don't feel good. It don't look good. It don't sound good. Come on, everything around you looks bad, and you're thinking, God, I know you can get me out of this. What's going on, God? Don't you love me? That, that wondering in that moment is the time where you're not you're not at a place of knowing it, but it's time to believe it. In that moment, begin to remind yourself, God loves me, and love will never leave me in a bad situation. Oh, but it looks like it's going down. God loves me, and love will never leave me in a bad situation. Oh, it looks like it's going to turn out bad. God loves me, and I know that love will need me. In a, oh, it looks like it's bad for the kids. God loves my kids. Come on, come on, come on. God loves my kids, and, and love will never leave them in a bad situation, so I will not fear. No longer am I a slave of fear. I'm a child of God, and God loves me. Stand up on your feet. Woo! Man, this is good today. Glory, 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 glory. Did you get something out of this? I mean, show your hand. Did you get something out of this? This is Facebook, I want to thank you all for allowing me to speak into your life. And I know this has been a, I've been messing with you. I was just messing. I wasn't serious. That's probably not you. Amen. 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 But just know that God's got more in store. I'm going to start a new series, not next week, but in November. And we're going to talk about how perfected love casts out fear. It's really a family series. And you'll understand it once I start teaching it. But the way to keep fear out of your heart and the way to cast fear out of your heart is by perfecting love. But how do you do that? Well, we'll talk about it in the name of Jesus. Would you all bow your heads with me? You might be here and this message really spoke to your heart.